Okay, hi everybody. We are online now. Um, so everybody in the room. So welcome uh, and happy to see many of you here with us today, um, online and also in person. I am Lucia Rivera and I am the co-lead of the Masterclasses Initiative of the World Food Forum. And this is the second flagship event of the World Food Forum. And I am happy and amazed to see how the movement and the network has grown in only one year. And also the knowledge exchanges and the opportunities keep increasing with the goal of empowering young people to actively change food systems. So let me tell you a little bit about the World Food Forum, even though you have been hearing about this all week long. It's a global platform and an independent network led by youth for youth and also young at heart folks, of course. It's a space where young people can share ideas and knowledge and participate in dialogues and consultations and inspire one another to make a difference to transform food systems. Um, so while the flagship event is happening this week, uh, we invite you to also stay alert because of course dialogues and other events are happening throughout the year. And these include innovation labs, educational activities, culinary arts, music, so a little bit of everything. And the purpose is to drive awareness, foster engagement and advocacy and mobilize resources, all in support of agri-food system transformation through youth-led action. So now the World Food Forum masterclasses touch on all areas of our agri-food system. And these consist on inspirational and educational content from emerging young leaders and from renowned experts. So in the master classes, we come to listen to the stories, the theory and the actionable solutions that these leaders have to share with us. And each episode covers one theme on food systems with the main goal to discuss and promote a better future for all. So today, an essential part of food is packaging. The whole food industry depends on packaging. How do we mobilize our food? How do we conserve it from large transnational scales to very small individual ones, like the late night delivery we order sometimes? So food packaging can ensure a sh uh, long shelf life, but to what environmental cost? And also, we have not been doing it in a very sustainable way or healthy way, either for us or for the planet. So new actionable solutions are urgent right now. And so this masterclass brings together entrepreneurs acting together for this goal, as well as researchers. So through the class, we will learn about the research that Wageningen University leads to preserve fresh product quality. And we will further understand also the concept behind packaging. And then followed by this introduction, we will hear from three extreme tech challenge startups innovations in this area. We will learn about what each of them is doing to then engage in a very interesting roundtable discussion with key questions on this. So we invite you to take notes throughout the class so you can ask your questions at the end. We will have a moment for Q&A. And so I'm finally glad to present to you our panelists. As you can see, one of us is here in person <laughs> and then the rest of them are joining us online. So first we have Elke Vestra. He is a sustainable packaging program manager at Wageningen University. Elke will be also our host and will moderate the discussion. Under the XTC Startup Innovations, we have Ignacio Parada de Fonseca, CEO and co-founder of BioElements. Then we have Kritika Tiagi, co-founder and head of product of Ertos. And here with me, Lori Goff, she is a CEO and co-founder of Outlander Materials. You will now learn from each of them and what they do. So now I pass the floor to Elke, over to you. Good morning, everyone. I hope I am loud and clear. Thank you for yes. 
with your food forum. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, my name is Elker Westra. I'm, I'm program manager post harvest research at Wageningen University and, uh, and research. And one of the important factors in maintaining product quality is obviously packaging, amongst other technologies. But packaging influences our environmental, uh, our environmental uh, a lot. And uh, I give a short presentation to set the stage and then continue with the, the, the other people that we have on our panel, because I think we need uh, new technology, new incentives to, uh, to change the way that we operate and uh, transport and store our food products. I will share my screen to give a short introduction. So, on sustainable food packaging, we know that uh, fossil-based packaging material ends up in nature and is polluting the nature around us uh, globally. And um, we've seen this effect. Uh, the, 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 the oceans are filling up with the plastics that we use. It doesn't degrade, so it remains in nature for almost, well, for centuries. And it's affecting actually our wildlife, our uh, living environment, and our health. And also from World Food Forum, what Lucia said, uh, the youth, but also uh, other uh, persons, they are looking for a change. Uh, we have to look for a solution because we don't have a second planet. Uh, we have to live on this planet and we have to work uh, with this planet and we have to create an environment which is livable for all of us. And not only humans, but also the nature and, and wildlife and um, anything around us. So we have to come to solutions. Well, the vision from Wageningen is that it should not only help to prevent food losses, and food losses has to be minimized. There are other sessions in the World Food Forum to target just specifically that. But it also has to be easy of use, uh, convenient, minimized cost, but to contribute to a livable world. And at Wageningen, we are convinced that all these things are possible. But we have to change the way that we are working right now. So together with the industry, we're looking for more sustainable solutions and to reduce packaging. And we're doing that actually with the R's. And these are well-known R's on replace, reuse, rethink, reduce, and redesign. But changing the way that we operate right now, which is a very efficient and cost-effective matter, it's uh, quite an... an, 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 an um, um incentive of a, a problem to tackle because we are used to the way that we live and we are used to the packaging uh, systems that we use so if behind each of them i've changed, placed a question mark so how to do that and i'm happy that we have a couple of entrepreneurs here that have solutions that actually tackle one of these topics and it's not so easy as you might think as it's not only the carbon footprint so it's multi-dimensional so what about the global warming potential how does it uh, save uh, food from being lost um, what about the recycling uh, is it recyclable uh, what about litter prevention what about circularity and not the last but not least what about the costs and there might be solutions but they have a different um, aspect where it's good or bad or better and depending on the situation, you have to find an, uh, an application of that new packaging material. And each packaging material can find its place in uh, the whole supply chain, um, preventing food waste and loss, but also have a, a, a sustainable impact on our world. Um, that's my short introduction. And I think it's good to start off with the panel discussion. I'll stop sharing and uh, kick off with a short introduction uh, of each of our panelists. So, um, Laurie, you're present in the room, so I'll give the floor to you and um, please uh, let us know um, what you want to share with us. Hello, everyone. My name is Laurie Goff. I'm the founder and CEO of Outlander Materials. It's a biotechnology and material science company based out of the Netherlands. And we use biotechnology to convert low value and waste streams that come from the food industry into intermediary products where we then turn them into functional, compostable, 
and completely non-plastic alternatives for thin film materials that can be used for packaging. Um, that's it, <laughs> short intro. Thank that's you, a lot. <laughs> and then over to you, Ignacio. So please introduce hey guys. yourself. Hey guys, it's a pleasure to, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, I hope, I wish I could be in, in Rome with you, but uh, well, online it's okay. Um, my name is Ignacio, as you know, I am uh, the CEO and founder of BioElements. We are a clean tech uh, scale up uh, today, and we are trying to make our best to try, try to rethink this problem, right? But uh, being trying to be as realistic as, as, as possible. So we, we think that obviously packaging um, must be changed in many ways, but we have to do it with uh, real uh, ideas. And our idea is to make um, biodegradable products that are not only biodegradable in, in, in the laboratory, but are biodegradable in, 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 in reality. And we uh, produce and, and manufacture products that are biodegradable in aerobic conditions, such as compost, and anaerobic conditions, such as a wasteland, uh, and also in marine uh, life and and also in in by the action of uh, ubiquitous fungi. So basically, what we're trying to do is to try to make biodegradable products, biodegradable packaging that is going to biodegrade regardless of where it's going to stay. So that's uh, our 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 idea of being real. So thank you, uh, Kritika. Yeah, hi everyone. Here. Um, so my name is Kritika. I'm the co-founder and head of product here at Earthos. I just want to start off by saying I feel um, very inspired by some of my co-panelists today. You guys have some fantastic companies, so I'm very excited to uh, engage in, in the discussion we have planned for today. Um, so Earthos is an advanced material science company, and a lot of what we do is we leverage uh, bio-based biogenic inputs like agriculture residue, uh, byproducts from uh, different farming resources, and we try to convert them into alternatives for single-use plastics. Uh, a lot of what that includes is packaging within the food service ware industry, and everything that we build and we create is not only bio-based, but also compostable, um, and ultimately has a significantly better LCA than some of our competitors in the traditional plastic space. So things like polypropylene, high density polyethylene. Um, so we have two great product at, the, at this moment. Um, we have an injection molding compatible material, which is more those rigid takeout containers that you see. Um, and then we have a flexible um, packaging as well, which is those films that you see stretch over foods. Thank you, Kritika. Uh, I think we have an excellent over uh, panel uh, with uh, with the nice new ideas which can actually change the, the way that we pack our food. So to start off with a question for you, Laurie. So I see on your website that you have uh, 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 pay of uh, waste is optional. Can you tell us more about that and, and how do you convey that message to uh, your clients and, and consumers? Yeah. Um... For us, I think it's a reimagination of what we consider waste and how we utilize our resources. For an exceptionally and too long period of time, we've used virgin resources to go into our materials. And that's, that's a really ineffective way of doing both um, how we allocate the resources towards food production, but also what we do with materials. And so then we've started looking towards the low value streams and waste that come from food production industry, which are like, massive and they're everywhere and they're mostly going to waste so we've considered how do we can how do we determine that and does it really need to be something that is wasted can it not be a resource and so if you consider that waste is optional it's an option that you can choose to use that as a new input for our products so we work with uh, all of the low value streams that come from our region mostly high value um sorry high sugar streams that are coming out as the side products and then we can convert those into intermediary products that have a higher value at the end of life. And, and how can you convey that message actually on, on uh, sustainability to the users of your product or even to end consumers? So how do they understand that choosing your material is more sustainable than going through uh, the normal standard materials? 
Um, I think at this point, most people are aware of the negative externalities that come from plastic production and use and how that ends up in the environment. So that's an easier hurdle. Um, you don't have to sell that problem anymore. And with our materials, we've, you know, they can still meet all of the same kind of criteria for barrier and physical properties that we're seeing from conventional packaging. So this part's met. And then we've done an extensive LCA across, um, starting from the inputs through production through the end of life. And we see a 70% reduction in carbon compared to a lot of the materials that we use currently in packaging. So for this, it's, it's fairly simple for a lot of the clients that come to us. For one, they like the story of beer. They're interested to learn that there's so much waste in it and that maybe drinking beer can lead to something better at the end. And they're happy that they can interact with a physical product that is both functional, um, has a lower carbon footprint, and at the end of life, completely degrades naturally in the environment. Okay. Thank you, Laurie. Going to you, Ignacio, um, with, with uh, biodegradable uh, products. So is, is that the, the, the main sustainability feature of your, of your product? Or do you also convey other sustainability elements of, of, uh, of the, the products that you market? It's a very good question. Well, um, as you know, guys, we're based in Latin America. So obviously the, the reality that we have is very different maybe in some countries that we can find in Europe or, or, or basically in Europe, if you compare Europe to us. Um, so we thought uh, when we started this company, we knew that we um, had the ability to be compostable in either home or, or uh, industrial uh, facilities. But no one composts in the end so when no one composts uh, then the question is are you really solving the problem so uh, that's that's basically the reason why we started and we started changing formulations and making new formulations to make it to make our our our, our products our bioproducts biodegradable uh in other conditions that was basically the idea behind our project so um i think that's something very important because and we think about sustainability like very in a very generic way, but we never think about it when we uh, go to the reality of the place where you are using that product. So, um, in, in in my opinion, it's not only about um, trying to trying to um, eliminate or trying to prohibit some products, just like I'm going to prohibit plastic or I'm going to use less plastic. Uh, if I'm going to use less of, of plastic, I'm not going to use more paper, for example. Is it paper more sustainable than plastic? Um, sometimes it's, it isn't. So we have to go to the core and to the reality of, of every product, of every uh, of every country, of every social environment that you can find. And that's what we did in, in BioElements, at least in, in, in from, from the United States to to down uh, to Chile, so that's how basically our idea. So we're not only trying to eliminate or trying to change conventional um, um, packaging products to um, new bioplastics or uh, new bioproducts or bio-based or biodegradable products, but trying to see really if the product is going to biodegrade according to the reality of that specific country. And um, that is something that we claim and that is something that we study. And I think that's where the core of our environmental sustainability is, more than changing just one product to a new one. So I don't know if I answer your, your good question there. No, I understand that you have a, a kind of a holistic approach where you look at specific context on which packaging might be uh, more sustainable than a conventional packaging. Correct. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what we're trying to do. So I think these kind of spaces are very important to try to see that, guys, if we say no to plastic, that's a word that it's impossible to fight. I mean, we need it. We have to use it. We have to use it wisely. And that's why we're here. But we can't say no to something without knowing the advantages of that product. We have to see it in a holistic way so that the product that we're trying to change is better than the product that is being changed. That's basically what, what we're trying to do at BioElements. Thank you. Coming to you, Kritika, um, what are your thoughts on that? So you have also biodegradable uh, products in your portfolio, developing those. Um, do you 
also have this realistic approach. Yeah, so um, something that we do that's very similar to bioelements is, you know, we look at both the lab-based uh, compostability that happens with our material, uh, but also the actual end of life where it goes into a compost facility and seeing whether there's compatibility between the formulations and the materials that we've built, uh, the form factor that they're going to be retailed in, as well as, again, that end of life that we're hoping to claim. Um, and so what we've done to really communicate this sustainability to our partners is we've actually developed a standard uh, internally, and that's called the Earth Standard. And so we provide communication guidelines to all of our partners to help them really break down what it is that they're sourcing from us. Um, and so it, it holds claims you know, around uh, bio-based, compostable, what those actually mean for each product that they'll be uh, looking at at sourcing from Earthos, um, and then obviously claims around uh, how we actually source some of those bio-based inputs. And so for instance, um, we don't use any wood-based cellulose in our, our formulations because we don't want to indirectly contribute towards deforestation. Um, or anything that we source uh, because it's agriculture residue, we make sure that we're not contributing to monoculture practices or we're not sourcing something that's in a nutrient rich environment or a nutrient poor environment because we don't want to disturb the biodiversity there. It's not competing with um, food resources. So all of these things are um, ideas that we factor into building our products to make it a lot more holistic. Um, and we build a comprehensive uh, communication guideline with our partners to help them understand exactly uh, everything that goes into building the material that they'll be getting. Uh, we also do LCAs with um, both third parties and internally uh, to really help partners understand again, uh, you know, what is that water conservation looking like when they're using our materials compared to some of the traditional inputs that they've been using in the past, uh, energy conservation, carbon dioxide emission, uh, the waste diversion that they're going to be seeing. Um, and finally, we do get uh, third party certifications for all of the claims that we make with our materials. And so uh, for Europe and, and um, sort of rest of the world, we work with TUV Austria to get their certifications around compostability. Uh, and then in North America, there's BPI. Um, so we're located in, in Canada. And so uh, we work with BPI here in North America to get certifications around compostability. And so that actually quantifies the time frame within which our material is going to break down up to what percentage and what that breakdown mechanism is going to look like. Um, and then we also actually do uh, information webinars. So uh, for certain terms that we're using today, like degradable, biodegradable, compostable, um, some of our partners may not know exactly what those means or people looking to get into the sustainability space. And so uh, we host a lot of educational webinars on what those means or differences in even just composting pathways and the mechanisms within which materials can break down. Uh, so we try to be as involved in the space as we can. Um, and again, conversations like what we're having today are so important for people to learn a lot more about the sustainability space and understand really the different solutions that are available. and. Uh, how they can actually help reduce some of the waste within uh, major supply chains that we're seeing today. Well, thank you for your answer, Rekritika. I think from all of you that, that you already have this multidimensional view actually on sustainability of packaging, and it's not a one dimension um, solution. Eh? So, and, and I think that's also the challenge in, in, in the world. So how can we move towards a more sustainable food packaging uh, system um, and uh, happy to hear that you're con contributing in this way um, coming back to another question so uh, we have the functionality of traditional plastics and th those are well known for for decades right now and 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 uh, we have the benefits of those materials in prolonging shelf life for days or even months uh, for certain uh, uh, products um, how do you take that into uh, relation with the the new development of your materials and the functionality of those materials um, starting with you laurie do you have any thoughts on that on how we compare the functionality of ourselves versus traditional plastic and what that means towards the sustainability of the overall product yes exactly so uh, hey, it's it's there to to uh, protect uh, the product that you pack but you're now introducing new materials with new functionalities or other functionalities yeah um Okay, so this is a super important question. <laughs> um, I think it's it's 
the impact from the overall product getting to a person is the most important factor. Most of the impact comes in the actual product that's being protected and packaging role is to get that product to the consumer and to be fully consumed um, in the best possible way. And so the first step of that when making new materials is to make sure that we can meet uh, the same kind of standards that are seen with current packaging. So barrier and physical properties need to be similar, if not even better than what we see from current packaging. And we've been able to meet most of those and even exceed most of the barrier properties that we see compared to a lot of plastics. So on the material side, as long as you can meet that, your first and biggest challenge is done. The next one is about mixing and matching that in the most effective way with the right product. Because the impact that comes from meat packaging is wildly different than a ketchup packet. And so from the meat packaging, since the impact there is so massive, the impact that comes from that package is only maybe 2% of the total uh, carbon emission. So in that one, you have a bigger responsibility to make sure that the meat ends up at the consumer and that it's consumed in the most effective time period. But when you already move down to dairy products and vegetables, the impact moves already up to 10%. So these are not negligible numbers. And there you can make, you have more headway to make more impact when you start looking at the packaging differently. And then when you get to the sauce packets, it's, I think it's almost 50%. And then we also take a look at not only this particular impact equation from, I think it's the PRI method, so um, packaging of relative environmental impact. So that's a quick equation that you can do to see where your, your product is falling. But after that, it's um, considering where the packaging ends up afterwards. And so when we look at, uh, I think, the sauce packet, so anything less than a, a five by five, is almost never recycled. Even if you have the most recyclable material in the world, it's not going to happen. So then that, that packet is completely wasted. And so we wanted to also create a product that looking at not only the impact of the packaging, but its impact at where it ends up in the system, that there you can also make more of an, like, make more of an impact. I'm saying that word too much almost in this sentence, but this is an important factor when it becomes if you're considering true sustainability of a product. And then um, what we've seen is that around 45% of food waste they're saying is coming from retail and uh, consumers. So when it gets to the household, but that waste doesn't come from new materials or different materials not meeting the shelf life. It's mainly that the expiration dates have been somewhat arbitrarily set to be sooner than when the product is actually no longer suitable to consume. So people are throwing away products that uh, are still fine to eat, but then you're contributing to food waste. And also in that a lot of products are packaged too big. So consumers are buying bulk products that they can't consume fully in that time period. And that's also part of how we should consider the design of the packaging and the serving sizes and more effective shelf life dates. So not to over or underestimate, but really put more research into what's the most effective true shelf life um, and then properly convey that to consumers. Well, well, thank you for your answer. I think you're also uh, stipulating that uh, rethink, reduce, reuse uh, and that mantra uh, comes also into place when, when looking at your uh, product. Um, for you, Ignacio, and, and maybe also for Kritika, so we're working with a biodegradable uh, material uh, you don't want it to be degrading whilst still uh, a packaging material. So here, the same question actually. So how do you balance the material with the, the actually the product conditions that you were stored in, and not only looking at the afterlife of the product? Ignacio, well, you yeah, first? yeah. Well, yeah. obviously, what uh, we were talking before about that the product that we are packaging is the most important because of it's, it's the idea if, if, if we don't work as a good packaging then why using us so obviously that that's the the most important point but there is obviously i think and i think uh critica has might have the, the same uh, um idea as i do maybe i hope so no <laughs> but we will uh, hear from uh, her <laughs> I think we have, uh, we as biodegradable products, we always have a, a big issue with the recyclability products or recyclable products. Um, I think we have to go um, a, a little bit further in that way because usually uh, we think that 
for example, biodegradable products are not uh, mechanically recycling, and that's not true. They are, if they are uh, recycled mechanically in a good way. And also, we I think we have to think a little bit out of the box, because if we use the same, the same ideas that we've been using in the last 50 years, I mean, concentrating everything on being mechanical recycling and blah, 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 and using all of, all of our efforts uh, towards that decision, then I think it's a, it's, a, it's a bad choice. Obviously, it hasn't worked. Otherwise, we've had, we could have much, was, uh, we've, we've, we've had more and more recyclable or recy recycled products. And that's, that's not the, the reality, right? So um, I think we have to balance, obviously, the, um, the good, the, 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 we have to balance the way that we are packaging things stuff that's the products that has to be our 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 goal but we have to think out of the box if we don't we're going to use the same materials we're not going to innovate as we've done in the last 40 years and i think that's the most important regardless of what material we're going to use in the future but we have to think uh, in a different way i don't know critica what do you think yeah no i i completely agree i think um especially with food packaging, recyclable solutions are not always going to be the answer just because there is food contamination and they're not going to be accepted by recycling stream. And I think uh, Laurie captured this perfectly as well, where if it's a certain size of packaging, it just doesn't get captured by the system. And so uh, really the best way for us to divert that food waste that's going to come along with that packaging is by making it compostable, by making it biodegradable. Um, and so something that we do with partners is we actually do a deep dive into their production process, into, uh, you know, their lifetime of a specific packaging. And so uh, for, for context, we build uh, resins, which we then retail to manufacturers and brands. And so uh, something that we have to understand is, you know, how long do you hold this packaging in your warehouse before you send it out to actually act as a packaging material for store shelves? And then from there, how long do your consumers interact with this packaging before they throw it out and it ends up, you know, in a compost stream? Um, and so understanding those life life um, frames really helps us understand whether this is an application which we can even pursue. Uh, because if it's meant for something like pasta packaging where it's a dry good and it can stay on the shelves for a really long period of time, then maybe it's not meant for biodegradable, biodegradable packaging. Um, and then we have to look at, uh, you know, something that's a little bit more, um, uh, like Ignacio said, a little bit more compatible with um, what a biodegradable solution can can really service. And so um, we do a, a lot of conversations with partners to really understand exactly um, the real world uh, life, life frame of, of this material. And uh, based on those, we will select the applications that we can work with. And again, I think... Um, you know, for, for every plastic good, um, there's going to be no silver bullet solution. We have to look at, you know, both reusability, recyclability, and compostability um, as potential alternatives um, all at once. It can't be just compostable or just recyclable because there's quite a lot of uh, plastic waste that we have to tackle. And I think we're all going to have to work together to really, um, really service um, the industry in that manner. So, um, I guess to answer your question, a lot of the, the applications that we work with are mostly single or immediate use. Um, and we make sure that there is a specific shelf life for all of these materials. And based on those, we'll actually get um, the correct FDA certifications for those, those um, particular applications. Um, and then make sure again, that we work with partners to ensure that that is the, the, life, the life frame of um, what each of these materials is going to be used within. Thank you for your answer, Kritika. So um, I think uh, it gives a good overview on, on, on the, the thought on this topic of, from all three of you. Um, last question, actually, to all of you. And I think this is uh, the elephant in the room. Um, uh, working with industry, changing the, the, the packaging material. Uh, a lot of uh, organizations uh, and industry have uh, long-term ambitions of making it more sustainable. Um, but on the short term, everything must be cost effective and not uh, too costly. So what are your thoughts about the added cost or the cost of, uh, of these new sustainable developments? 
Laurie, you have uh, thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, well, I think I might actually mirror a lot of what Kritika just mentioned on how closely you work with the partners and really understanding how they're, they're producing the materials, the logistics around what's going on there. And so in imagining how we scale up with our clients, we've done deep dives into their processes and we've decided to co-develop the material for most of our launching clients so that it fits within their systems as seamlessly as possible. So to make sure that they don't need to um, purchase new types of equipment that are necessary for packaging, to reduce the switching costs as much as possible, to lower the hurdle for them to adopt a new material, which is already a big, a big hill for them as well. Um, and then as we scale up and already having a lot of these places smoothed over, that reduces the cost moving forward. And when our capacity increases even further, we using a cost plus, um, cost plus kind of uh, financing for this, we'll be able to reach parity with most uh, packaging materials within only a few years. So for us, it is an investment in the beginning now because it's a little bit more expensive, but that's also the investment that most of our clients have seen that this is something that they need to do for their own companies to say at the forefront of sustainability moving forward. Thank you. Ignacio, your thoughts on costs? Yeah, well, obviously yeah. it's uh, always difficult to, to have the same cost as a multi-billion, trillion, uh, or whatever billion uh, dollar uh, industry uh, that we are in. I mean, uh, if you, we're, we're, we're trying to make things different and we are maybe Bio-based products are less than one percent of all the bioplastics, so of all the plastics or thermoplastics in the world. So obviously, it's a big challenge. But in my idea, if you don't have a good price, then you're not sustainable at all, because uh, you have to think about being sustainable also and create an impact in 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 making it uh, as affordable as possible. And also trying to measure all the advantages, just as uh, you guys were talking about CO2. Um, a carbon, whatever, uh, the, the, the amount of energy that we are using. For example, just, just as, as an example, we have a very big client that uh, is a bottling company. And after one year and a half of doing tests, we, we never got to the price. But then we saw that they were using our products with a less, uh, uh, with a less heat and less heat is less energy. And you can measure that. And then we got to a good price. <laughs> so with the with the rising energy prices, and uh, we were able to see these uh, um, good external externalities about our pro our bio products, and that's uh, how we ended up with uh, with good prices. But trying to, in the end, if you don't have a good price, you're not going to sell, and you're not going to create any impact. So obviously, a good price a good price has to be in the center of I think any business at all. Thank you, Ignacio. And uh, what about you, Kritika? Yeah, I think I have to I have to echo but what both um, Laurie and Ignacio said. Um, you know, we work directly with our partners to understand what is their cost appetite, um, because obviously currently, uh, because we are in a, a smaller scale company, our pricing is a little bit higher than than um, their traditional plastics. But like Ignacio said, if you don't have a good price, you're never going to convert a partner. And in that way, you know, you could have the best product on the market, but you you will never make any sales. And so we're a lot conscious. We're, we're quite conscious on um, obviously the cost that we're imparting to our partners. And so uh, some of the ways in which we're able to reduce that is by reducing the cost to own the material. Or um, obviously, as we scale um, our our um, production and and you know our, our operations, uh, we'll be seeing that costs come down quite a bit. But I think something that I'll add on to um, what, we're, what we've been talking about here today is, you know, if, if we really want to see a lot of the solutions, um, like the ones that, you know, Laurie, Ignacio and I are building, uh, we really have to have to see more buy-in from um, uh, the industry. And so the more buy-in that we see, the lower the cost of goods like these is going to be, because again, the reason why plastics are such a cheap commodity is because 
there are so many people who are investing in plastics. There's so many people who are willing to consume uh, traditional plastics. And so um, if you want to interact with, you know, bio-based compostable materials, you have to actually invest in them early on so that the industry costs can go down and for us to be able to manufacture these materials and bring these solutions to partners. Um, you know, we have to see that buy-in starting to come in from the industry so that those costs will ultimately um, start to come to parity with some of those traditional materials. Thank you, Kritika. And uh, I think uh, you all shared the view that uh, as well, also for traditional packaging materials, uh, you also have to look at the, the cost of uh, the environmental cost and exactly the, the true pricing of of our current system. So it's not only the material cost, but it comes at a even greater cost of what we're trying to mitigate with sustainable packaging and uh, and and through the, the solutions that you offer. So um, I totally agree on uh, on uh, on that uh, with you. Um, looking at the program, um, we still have room for a Q and A from uh, from the audience uh, as well uh, on site as online. So I kindly ask: um, Does anyone have a question for one of our panelists? I saw one question from Jose Miguel, uh, and it says how bioelements prevents the formation of microplastic. I think it's a very good question because um, sometimes we confuse uh, fragmentation with biodegradability, and that's uh, a, a very important concept that we have to think about. Um, it's not; it's the same biodegradability. If you can compare it to, imagine you have a piece of paper, um, and you cut the paper into a million pieces, you have the same mass. Uh, biodegradable be means losing mass, converting into something other, serving as a fountain of energy, right, or carbon, and that's being biodegradable. So basically, if you have a biodegradable product, uh, in 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 maybe in one condition or all, more conditions, then you have to see, then you are really being biodegradable by losing mass. But if you only fragmentate. And obviously, you're not losing any mass. You're just hiding the the problem, right? So I think I wanted to really uh, uh, answer that question because it's very important for me, at least, um, as as a concept. There's another question in the in the chat. So how do you increase awareness about sustainable packaging amongst youth, young people? So this is the the question from Hanin. Who wants to answer that question? How to increase aware awareness amongst young people? Um, so I can I can start that off. Um, so we do uh, quite a lot of educational content. Um, like I mentioned, we do webinars, which we uh, share with some of our partners um, with with the universities. Um, and then again, we, we have partnerships with programs uh, where students are working within the sustainability space. And so uh, we're able to come in and, and do some talks. Uh, we're able to invite them into some of the content that we're creating. Um, but obviously the youth uh, functions on social media. And so uh, we do a lot of infographics on Instagram. And so uh, for some of them, we actually collaborate with um, industry certification bodies and standard bodies um, so that we know that everything that we're putting out um, is correct and, and verified and vetted. Um, and so those are some of the infographics that we'll share, you know, on Instagram, on Twitter. Uh, we do Instagram Reels uh, just to sort of try to connect with uh, the youth of today. Um, and so we, we try to leverage sort of, um, again, the, the traditional route of, of going in and, and talking to um, individuals and then also um, trying to leverage social media. Any response from the other panelists on this question? <laughs> We have a, we prefer a sort of the more offline but intimate touch and that uh, we're fortunately located in a place called Blue City, which is a a converted indoor swimming pool that's now a circular economy hub, which is a really nice spot for uh, a lot of students to visit and join. And so we do um, tours through the event space and discuss sustainability, not only from our own company, but all of the companies that are there. Um, and then that crosses multiple stages. So like sustainability within the building environment, sustainability within foods, new materials, across the board. And then with a lot of the students and also the universities that are around us, we do programs, internships, um, and then 
different types of workshops and study projects so that they're intimately connected with the types of processes that we and our partner companies work with. Thank you, uh, Laurie. I think that also goes for uh, for Wageningen, Wageningen University, where we have actually a whole community of uh, young people studying here at our university, uh, and it's uh, at teaching and uh, but also from our side uh, doing where you see on campus a lot of sustainable initiatives on actually how we are providing food and storing fruit on our campus. It can be even more sustainable, but also we have to be realistic uh, on uh, on how to go through uh, the, the the packaging materials that we have on our campus. Any other questions from the audience? Maybe someone on site? Yeah, exactly. I want to encourage people here physically as well. Does anybody have any questions? We can pass the floor to you. Don't be shy. <laughs> Okay, no questions. Okay, I no think, questions. yeah, no, I think Collins also had a question, but he's online connected with you. If no questions arise here, I'll pass the floor to him. No, we don't have any more questions online. Maybe a quick question from the one of our panelists. Uh, I have a question for Elke. <laughs> Um, how do you think that uh, academy or like universities, um, do you think they are really getting involved with the, with the new solutions or is it just in an academy uh, status? Are they really doing stuff, at least uh, your university, uh, with, uh, with companies like uh, BioElements or like, or, or like Critica's company or I don't know? Uh, Good question. Uh, yes, uh, we do, Ignacio. So uh, we have a whole uh, business unit working on uh, bio-based uh, materials that doesn't not only uh, cover uh, packaging, but also other uh, materials like building materials. So what you see behind me is the whole uh, research plan for uh, biodegradable materials. Um, it's through education, it's through a consultancy, it's but also from uh, contract research, where we also work with large, uh, you already mentioned it, the, the, the multi-millionaire uh, dollar uh, companies who also want to make their product uh, line more sustainable. But you see more and more startups also looking for collaboration with more academic uh, partners, which have the infrastructure, but also the years of experience on uh, developing those materials and testing it in uh, realistic environments, what the added value of the material is. So um, great. Yes, we do. Hope, hopefully, we're gonna speak in the in the near future because I think that the relationship between the academy, the universities, and company startups or is super important. And, and, and I, I think it's so. Critical. Uh, and, and because also our role is knowledge and research, our role is not to market something to industry and think that's where uh, companies like like you have uh, play a very important role also to make this change in the whole system. Uh, so traditional companies, uh, new materials actually cannibalize on their existing portfolio and uh, you guys don't have that problem. So you can bring this new energy, this new materials to a market that's looking for solutions uh, and, and stepping away actually from the traditional system. Um, and it's, uh, I'm very happy to work with these type of, of yeah, new developments uh, and, and making the world a better place. Thank you for your, for your answer. Any, if there are no other questions, I would like to hand over back to Lucia. Actually, we do have two more questions. Okay. <laughs> okay, one of them is, what are the main challenges within your work scope you wish to tackle? This was asked by Hanin. I don't know if some of you wants to go first. I think our next main challenge is scaling up production capacity. Um, that's somewhat difficult to do in when you're a startup, you have kind of a small scale ability and a lot of the testing um, that needs to be done is on industrial scale. So many, many thousands of kilos to run a pilot with the company. 
So for us, the biggest challenge is how to scale up effectively with minimal resources to do so. Yeah, I would I would echo that. We're uh, we're looking at scaling up now uh, quite a bit, um, just to obviously validate uh, some of those scale up metrics that we have in house. Um, but I think something else that we're looking at uh, tackling now is is trying to get some level of um, uh, comprehensiveness within the industry, and so um, getting that alignment on you know exactly what compostable bio based solutions mean, uh, and then making sure again that that alignment is global so that um, one organizations like ours can work a lot closer um, and and sort of just you know, bounce ideas off of each other because we know exactly what all the terminology that we're using um, exactly means and, and exactly within which frame it fits into, um, but also understanding exactly the policies that are coming out globally and, and making sure that, again, those are comprehensive and, and addressing plastic waste, um, but are also allowing innovation to continue and take place. Um, and again, they're, they're making sure that solutions like ours can actually be uh, a viable solution for partners to to choose. Thank you, Pritika. Uh, last question from Collins. Oh, I see another one popping up. Um, how do you intend, intend to mobilize large corporates to buy into sustainable packaging? Uh, well, there is the commercial side, right? So we have to try to try to sell in our case we're a triple impact company we're a b certified corporation uh, so i think that is something very important we, we're not only looking for uh, to generate uh, money we are also it's important for us to create a, a social and uh, a social impact obviously and an environmental impact which is like in the core of our business right but um if you think about these uh, stuff uh, these these uh, three um uh, triple impact uh, um, ideas, then you have a lot to do with ESG. And today ESG is uh, much more important for large and medium corporations, either, even to get uh, more um, or better credits. So uh, there is a lot to do. There is a lot to um, a lot to see. And I think bio-based bio and biodegradable products and also packaging as a whole has a lot to do with it. And I think we are like uh, in the middle of the storm and we have to uh, we need to make new products and we need to not to not to take uh, new products away and not to make see or 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 think that they are bad and we have to try to create the like a bigger market for them um so i think these kind of forums are very good because we can we can talk we can be honest uh, with uh with the problems that we have and uh, it's uh i think large corporations or medium corporations are going to see it and they're going to buy if we have a good product and we solve the problem right okay thank you um, i agree i think um uh we're living in an age where you know our consumers are very uh, well educated as well and they're demanding better solutions and so um, if they see that there are better solutions available again that helps us sort of um, push corporations to uh, buy into sustainable alternatives a lot more. Um, and then again, I think corporations are coming out with uh, really aggressive CSR policies around what they're looking to achieve in the next couple of years. And so the more we can align with those as well, um, just by way of sort of the, the environmental savings our solutions provide, um, I think that helps us push those corporations into um, using and, and, and consuming materials like ours. Thank you. Um, there are two more questions, but I'm, I think we're running out of time. So maybe Lucia, uh, the post half thing, it's a bit out of scope. So uh, please drop me a message and I'll answer that one-on-one. Um, -on -one. Do we have more time for the question for Ignacio? I guess you can answer very quickly. We can take up like two more minutes. Finish okay. tomorrow. So the last question is for you, Ignacio. If you have considered working with activists to push for policies in Latin America? 
I think uh, more important than activists is working with universities. Uh, if we if we work with the universities, in our case, we have 17 um, contracts from 17 different universities trying to make our products better, in, from Mexico to Chile, in, in in all the countries that we are. Uh, in that way, activists or people that think they are activists are going to see that you have a basis on the claims that you are doing and the idea that you can always uh, make a product better. For example, when we started, we didn't have any marine biodegradable certification or study, and now we do. And that's after seven years of or and a half of working in this space. So uh, our idea is that maybe sometimes activists or what you think about activists are just like they have the, the truth and the truth is a very um unstable manner um so we have to work with universities with the academy to try to solve the problems that's where we are trying to to, to work a lot with okay thank you for your answer ignacio um i think uh, we're coming to the end of the q a and i'll uh, thank uh, all the, the the persons who uh, posted the question thank you for your questions and i'd like to hand back to lucia Thank you so much, Selke. And I just want to close this session by thanking all of our speakers who joined us even from very difficult time zones right now and from very far away. So thank you for being here and also all of you who came physically to sit with us um, and just invite you to follow all the rest of the World Forum event uh, that will last until Friday. Thanks and have a nice day. Thank you, guys. It was thank a pleasure. You. Bye. Bye. Bye.